Hi, I'm Alex Michael, co-head of Lion Tree Growth. We have a terrific new episode of Kindred Cast today. I am joined by none other than Michael Linton. Michael, it's great to have you here. Great to be here. Michael is uh, no slouch, I'll say, in terms of this biography, which I can't even do within a small amount of time. But just to ground our listeners in who Michael is, if you have not come across his bio, Michael is currently the chairman of Snap. Of course, used to be Snapchat, now Snap, the multi-multi-billion dollar tech company. He is also uh, the chairman of Warner Music, which is pretty exciting. Previously, Michael was CEO of Sony Entertainment until about 2017-ish, yeah, yeah, around there, yeah, and then you went that. full-time into the Snap thing. Uh, he also serves on no shortage of boards, Aries Management, Schrodinger, uh, the Boston Beer Company, mm-hmm. favorite beer. I like, I, I'm partial to Sam Adams. Uh, you also were on the board of Pearson. You also serve on the boards of the Tate and um, just the Rand Corporation, USC School of Cinematic Arts, Natural Resource Defense Council. And I'll just on and on. Los Angeles County Museum. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be here. I thought it was particularly awesome to have you on the show because we are in such an interesting time in the world. You can say that. I thought today, given that you've sat on these... Uh, so many intersections and so many different points in time in terms of the change of technology and media that this would be a great time to get your thoughts on what's going on in the world. Yeah. So let's start maybe with the snap side for a second. Sure. It's been in the news. It always is in the news, social media in general. But uh, perhaps because I always found it interesting, like how did Michael Linton, who was running an old school sort of studio business amongst other things at Sony, end up at Snap? Oh, and and you've told this story so, but but for sure, our listeners, sure, 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 sure. I think because people are always like, how did that happen? I'm happy to describe it again, okay. and I really, uh, at least the the initial introduction, I have my wife and daughters to thank for, which is that Snap started on the west side of L.A. where we were living. They started using it early. My daughters did this a long time ago, eleven years ago almost, and I started using with them. And my wife uh, looked over my shoulder at one point, and she became. Um, intrigued by it because of the fact that it disappeared. And she was concerned at the time about permanence on the internet. So she actually wrote Evan Spiegel, uh, she wrote him directly to customer service. And uh, you know, at this time it was a tiny organization, it was basically six or seven of them. And said if there was anything she could do or uh, be helpful, she would love to do that. And he actually was in our, over at our house inside of a couple hours and the two of them fell to talking. Um, Jamie wound up investing in the company. That's my wife. But after that, so that's the introduction to it. And she then, just called customer service, which was basically she wrote, Evan. She, she wrote. wrote a, and Evan came on over, and the two of them yeah. got along famously. And they were in the midst of needing a little bit more money as an interim step. And, yeah, Jamie wrote a check, which was unusual. She's really not done much of that. Well, she's done none of it before and very little of it since. Did she ask your opinion? No, okay. she, but that's mostly the case. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, after that, uh, Evan and I started meeting on a very regular basis. His office at the time was down in Venice, which was right down the road from the studio in Culver City. You know, you just drove down Venice Boulevard, and he would come over a couple of times a month, and we would take long walks around the studio um, and have lots of conversations about management and Snap and various issues. And then eventually when we f- the company formed a little board, when Benchmark came on, I joined the board. And then eventually when the company decided to go public, I left my position at Sony and serve as chairman of the, of the public company. So that's sort of it. It was a little bit of happenstance, a little, but more of it then was Evan and I spending a lot of time together and becoming very, very good friends and, and, and sort of collaborate in a lot of things that went forward. And which has persisted, obviously, to this day. You yes. Continue. You get to spend, as you mentioned, you, you, you did long walks with Evan. You've now been with him and this journey, which has obviously been a massive success for, I don't know, eight years. No, longer, longer. ten, more than ten, ten years. years. Yeah. You see him at least once a quarter for board meetings, let alone probably more. And maybe you talk a little less as the company's become so massive. But what do you see, and he's one of these, you know, sort of tech 
pioneers, at least of the social media landscape of the last 15 years. What do you see that perhaps the rest of the world doesn't see? Um, well, I actually think I see probably what most of the world could see but doesn't necessarily always see. Um, first of all, Evan is, has this extraordinary ability to see slightly into the future. And by slightly, I mean, you know, far enough ahead that he's ahead of anybody else, which allows him not only to be enormously innovative in what he's doing, but also to make sure that he steers the company in the right direction. And I think a lot of the things that Evan is responsible for is why we haven't had some of the problems that some of the other companies have had, for example, around news and other issues. Evan very early on, for example, split the, the, the news part of our platform, which is Discover, from the communications part of our platform, which prevented that primarily because he understood where, where that would go if he allowed the two to stay together. Um, I think Evan has a real North Star. He has enormous integrity, enormous belief in the importance, for example, of connection and community, and, and um, that's reflected in his management style. Um, he's a deeply compassionate person. He believes in kindness um, and respecting the other individuals, all of which, as I say, is evident if you know him and all of which is evident if you sort of even saw him from a distance, but some people on occasion may not see that. So, so you've had a front row seat and it's percent. I have, and it's been consistent since the day I met him. Hmm. You know, there are many things about Evan that have evolved and developed, um, but his, his ability to, to see what is right and what is true and stay the course has always been there. There has never been a day where I have not been proud to be a part of that organization. Wow. Not a single day. Fantastic. And you clearly have your choices of organizations you could be along, and you continue to vote with your time. It, it's been it's been a wonderful, wonderful. And day. how involved are you? I mean, I've been. I think they just announced a drone project. I mean, the hardware element of the business continues to yep. grow. Yeah. Were there points in time where you're ever like, well, do you really want to be in hardware? Are you camera? I, you know, are you? Do you? How much of your imprint is on the organization? I, you know, I, I as I said, Evan and I have a very close relationship, but. What, what SNAP is today is entirely because of Evan and the group of people he's put around him in day-to-day -day operations. Um, when you ask, do we want to do this, do we want to do that, yeah, we talk about things, broadly speaking. But th the, the company, and part of the reason why it is so exciting, is because it really is about innovation. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine another internet company on, on many levels, at least a consumer-led internet company that can be as innovative as, as Snap is. Does everything succeed? Of course not everything succeeds. You can't do that and constantly be challenging yourself. And you know, some of that is hardware. A lot of that, as you know, are, are software applications on, on, on the platform. Um, and no, you know, there's, I, I, I can't take personal responsibility for it. Of course, we talk about those things sure. both as a board and, and outside the boardroom. You're obviously very familiar with the Asian tech landscape, I would imagine, given your time in international with AOL yeah. and then, of course, with Sony. We have not seen in this country the super app yet, the mm -hmm. WeChats of the world, which has basically Uber and PayPal and all in Snap one. all in one. Yep. Why, why do you think that is? don't really know. I, 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 you know, I think the internet here or the applications just evolved differently from the way they did in, in, in China in particular. So I, I couldn't give you exactly the reasons for why it evolved in one direction and didn't evolve in that way here. Will it? Is that a future? Or are we going to see these things smash together? I, I think each one of the larger platforms are trying to do that. My suspicion is it's too competitive a landscape for anybody to sort of have dominance the way they would do in some of the other markets. Got it. So we probably won't see it here. I would doubt it. I would doubt it. So speaking Not for a regulatory reason, just for a competitive reason. Got it. So speaking of one of these platforms, Twitter's been in the news a lot. Yeah. Have you ever met Elon Musk? No. I've never met would Elon Would you like to meet Elon Musk? Uh, sure. Who wouldn't want to eat Elon Musk? Who, I mean, <laughs> that, would be, that would be fun. It would be fun. What do you think? Is he going to buy Twitter? I am as confused as the next person. What? I genuinely... I mean, one, per one minute it's yes, the next minute it's maybe. It would appear that he's on the hook to buy it. I, you know, I honestly... Would I, you like to see him own it? Would I like to see him own it? There's an aspect of me that would like to see him own it, if only because I think 
the, the, the platform itself has a lot of promise that maybe it hasn't realized yet. And he tends to be somebody from a distance, I would observe, who, who does add, again, technological innovation to things. And I think he would allow it to achieve some of that. There's obviously some things I'm concerned about, particularly the way, some of the things he said about what he wants to do with the platform. So it's sort of a mixed bag in my Got estimation. It. So that was a little on social media. We'll, we'll leave that for now. Okay. Let's talk about movies. Yeah. You're a big Tom Cruise fan? I am a big Tom Cruise fan. Did you work with him, meet him? I don't think I've ever met Tom Cruise, no. Uh, and certainly I've never worked with him. But okay. I've, you know, since Risky Business, I've been a <laughs> huge fan. As have I. Now, he has a movie I hear that's doing quite well, Top Gun. Yeah, I haven't two, seen I it. Guess. I missed it this weekend, Paramount. but I'll definitely see it. Yeah, It has uh, set the world on fire. I think it did $150 million in I its saw that. first four Amazing. days. And it's 350 or something globally. It's incredible. Mm. Now you, uh, you and I have uh, talked about this a while ago. When I, you know, four years ago, the writing on the wall potentially about movie theaters and people not going to movie theaters. Pandemic yeah. clearly accelerated the idea that you could break through the windowing and go direct to consumer. Right. It seems like maybe the theater business is not done yet or totally. No, it seems like people want to go back to the movies. Is this a blip? And a momentary thing and an otherwise just progressional demise, or are we maybe going to see a different type of future? What, what's your overall take on the current movie system? I, guess? I mean, to state the obvious, because so many people have already said it, it, what did seem to have happened over the course of the pandemic and now that we're coming out of it and people are going back to the movie theaters is that the theater business per se has become more of a blockbuster business than it ever was, and that you require big franchises, Top Gun or Marvel or whatever the case might be to be successful in it. And those, the, the I, I don't really know where the smaller independent movies lie in this new world. What's What I don't think has an opportunity going forward are those sort of mid-level pictures that we used to make for, I don't know, 30, I don't even know what the numbers yeah. look like. I've been out of the business now for quite some time those sort of romantic comedies or thrillers that sat in the middle that you sort of chunked out and they paid the bills. Right. That feels like something that people are not willing to get up out of their homes and go to at this point. But the, certainly the blockbuster business for now seems to be going great. Is that enough, though, to sustain the whole industry like that, the movie theater industry? Um, I don't honestly know whether there's enough blockbusters in the year to keep it going because there was that that middle piece that was that was that was necessary at the time um, I would imagine though on the whole if people actually keep going the way that they seem to have been going that will work out well for the movie theaters uh, when we did speak about this you talked about actually don't focus on the first week or the weekend focus on the second week right what, what did you mean by that well I mean with a large movie like the Top Gun movie um, it was really marketing that would get people in the door for the first weekend, and then subsequent to that, it was word of mouth that would determine who shows up in the second weekend. And you really wanted, at a minimum, for the second weekend to be 50% of the box office of the first weekend. Um, when you and I spoke, I think it was right as we were slowly coming out of the pandemic. It may even have been when Spider-Man showed up mm -hmm. or something along those lines. And I said and it proved that Spider-Man kept going, but I, I didn't know whether it would or it wouldn't, that really the people were so thirsty or hungry to get out of their homes and do something that maybe just the first weekend would show up and that the second weekend wouldn't be there. I don't know in this new world what that looks like. It's, it's imperative that that second weekend is a strong weekend. Um, so let's see how all these things yeah, go. I don't I don't really know. Should be. But, it, you know, it's interesting to see that people are willing to show up. I, I think the thing that's unknowable that everybody's still trying to work out, and a lot of people have already been caught wrong-footed about this, is trying to predict people's behavior in this new environment. Post-pandemic. Post-pandemic. Yeah. I think, I mean, my personal, just, just based on myself, I think the, the, the general audience or consumer is slightly confused in a fog um, less so than they were perhaps six months ago. I mean, you know when the big movies now are coming. I couldn't have even told you that that was the case. For whatever reason, I didn't know how they were showing up on people's radar. Um, but I don't know yet that we have seen a predictable 
pattern of how people are going to behave in this environment. It's a pendulum, just like our politics to a certain extent. Yeah, like I we have that. everyone does Zoom and Pelotons, and then now no one's doing it. And now everyone's live events, and then that'll go too far, and people will be like, I, I did all that. these things. I agree with that. So yeah. to your point, maybe the normal's in the middle of it all where it was, but I'm not sure. And that'll flesh out. Yeah. That'll flesh out. I think it's probably a mistake right now for people to make predictions and I don't mean by that pundits, but I mean like people who are actually trying to figure out their corporate strategy right. based on people's behavior at the moment. Because I don't think what we're doing today is necessarily what we're going to be doing. It's a year not normal. Say, but it, but it probably did expedite some trends that yeah, you know, it would were, appear fair to stay. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Hollywood and big budgets, uh, there's been a lot of hand wringing of late of potential cost cutting. Uh, right. Netflix certainly had its recent earnings. Uh, David Zaslav has taken over uh, at Warner Discovery, and they certainly have a lot of debt to contend with. So there's talks about put that, cutting back. On I read some about of the that a little there. bit. Yeah. Did we reach a peak of uh, streaming, and now it's a slow uh, sort of demise as we tighten budgets, and and it's not just the north star of subs for these things? Like, where where do you see our streaming world right now? I what I do observe is that people seem to be attracted to these platforms, these streaming services, for the new stuff, um, more so than they were perhaps five years ago when it was catalog or library. Um, and that people seem to cycle off the minute that there isn't new stuff that they want to have, which would suggest to me that we, I don't, you know, I understand right now, given the recent announcement that Netflix, that everybody suddenly says, whoa, that wasn't what we had thought was how this was all going to go, and maybe we should look at our business models again. But if really people are showing up to see the new stuff, you're going to have to keep making new things and that would suggest that we're, you know, that the, that there will still be a very, very healthy amount of film and television being produced in the future. How many platforms at sort of full run rate are we here? Are we, it seems like you mean when reached, it's when the whole we, thing settles out. Yeah, we've reached sort of it seems subscription saturation to a certain extent already. Yeah, yeah. But who, who, which platforms do you think are just the winners and here to stay? Um, I think Netflix is here to stay. I think Disney is here to stay. I suspect HBO Max is here to stay, you know, and a couple of others will. It, it's hard for me to imagine that all of the pl various players are going to stick around and that everybody doesn't start. Either they will become niche players or they'll beca become part of a bundle, but anybody would tell you that. I mean, it just seems like every, everybody rushed in all at once and it. it, it I'm. I myself am thoroughly confused by the whole thing. So <laughs> what goes out you know, at some. So point, we end up at five or six that people are subscribed to, basically with the yeah, ball. Yeah, it feels that way. Yeah. yeah, it feels that way. Now you oversaw Breaking Bad when you were at Sony and some high profile shows. I was there. I was the guy who said this is the worst idea for a television show I've ever heard. You were gonna cancel it or not greenlight? We were never gonna make yeah. it. I was sitting with Zach and Jamie, who now run Apple Plus. Apple will be there, and I'm sure in the future. There's one of your five. And. Uh, they, we were going through the green light process, and I said, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's an advertising-based, uh, it was, you know, it was up there on an advertising-based uh, cable network, and who's going to want to, what pharmaceutical company is going to want to be right next to a show about that, about making crystal meth? Yeah, yeah. Um, in any event, and I own that, and I... They made a documentary about the making of it, and I said that on air too. And I, w I couldn't have been more wrong. It just shows you nobody knows anything. And how do, were they and able Zach to do it? They just over. Uh, you I were said, the boss. "Hey guys, it's your career. You know, if you really want to do this, have at it." Because on the one hand, it wasn't that much money in the scheme of things, and on the other hand, they felt incredibly passionately about this. And it turns out they were right, and I was wrong. Is there is there a leadership lesson in that? I, because you were in so many positions of authority. You could have shut it down. You make decisions all the time. If, if I say a couple of things. If it had cost so much money, just this is the, just the, the pilot itself, let alone the whole series, that it could have significantly hurt our year if it had failed, you probably would have said no. Got it. On something that is, uh, how shall I say it, that has such a strong point of view as that, um, there's stuff in the, in the middle that I think everybody can have a point of view on. There are certain things that you really have to feel it to know whether it's good or not. If somebody who is presenting it to you feels it that strongly and you just don't see it, 
and it doesn't tick the other box, meaning it's going to topple the things phone, over, yeah. chances are you should probably do it. Now, if they're always banging the table saying, this is the one, this is the one, then you know to sort of discount it. But that wasn't Jamie or Zach's uh, MO. They rarely said that. This was sort of the first time I'd heard them say, this song is really special. And where would you see Breaking Bad if you were releasing it today? Where, what, what service do you think it would be on? Uh, it could be on a lot of things. It could be on Apple Plus for sure. It could be on HBO Max. I think there's a lot of different things it could I mean, be it's on. It's a fantastic for show. Sure. There's a lot of things about Breaking Bad that are sort of amazing. So, for example, Breaking Bad wouldn't have been the success that it is had it not played on Netflix after the third season because it never really got the audience on the cable side that it deserved until people caught up with it um, on Netflix. And then all of a sudden, in a rush after the third. The second piece of it is you never would have seen a show or rarely seen a show like Breaking Bad before you do, did have binge watching or catch up TV or ever what you want to call it. Because in the past, you know, people had to see shows sequentially. They had to see them. And if they didn't see them sequentially, they dropped out because the plot didn't make any sense to them. So it really, it was the technology that also allowed something like that. That's Breaking a great Bad point. And, and do you believe there was some, there's some question now with the recent sort of Netflix sort of headwind of maybe the story dump or the not waiting for it is a negative to the business. What, how do you feel about that? You know, John Langraff, the guy who runs FX, who's a great television executive, once termed it, at least I heard him term it, maybe he took it from somewhere else, the, the idea that you drop it one week at a time as tantric television. <laughs> and I think he has, and that that was probably the preferred way to go. And I think he is on to something because for a lot of reasons, for not least of which you, if you binge it, then you cycle off the service. But also if you drop an episode one time a week, it allows other forms of media to embrace those episodes, to talk about those episodes. You build audience over the course of the whole season. So I'm actually a fan of tantric television, okay. as John used to call it. So let's let's switch to music. Yeah. Chairman of Warner Music mm-hmm. currently. Uh, obviously one of the foremost labels. You were uh, in charge of Sony Music for a time. Mm-hmm. So I feel you're qualified for this uh, genre. I oversaw it. Rob Stringer now and then before him, Doug Morris was but the you, you oversaw yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, they, they it, reported it, it, me. Ultimately the buck yeah, stopped absolutely. with you. So I, I find like we're, we're in an interesting time here in music. Spotify has sort of taken over our listening to a certain extent. Yeah, although Amazon is huge in the business, as is Apple still. Still big and growing, and yep. they're serious, too, and, and other players. But, yep. but Spotify sort of captivates and yep. has a lot. I, I think I read it's they, front of mind, for sure. They paid $7 billion to right hold, rights holders in 21. Like, these are enormous sums of money. It's been fantastic for the music companies and, and the artists both, yeah. Is it fantastic for Spotify? Um, you know, I, 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 I've, I've read through their financial statements. I think it's a little tricky to make money given, given where the rights holders' economics lie. So over time, I don't know where it all sits. For the time being, we're at stalemate. Meaning, you know, we have agreements with Spotify, the, th- the three majors do, and we are where we are. But I don't know whether this is the way that Spotify will make its money. There's a lot of other places Spotify can make its money. We know those, spoken word and other things. Well, we'll talk about that. And advertising-based side of the platform, which sure. is also a, you know, a big piece of the business for them. There are 25% gross margins today. Give right. Take. It hasn't really moved. It goes down a little bit. Right. It seems a tough place to be. Certainly the market has punished it to a certain extent recently, but we ebb and flow and the overall consumer tech took a hit. So you can't say too much, but music labels love it, right? It's been an right. absolute boom and renaissance. Um, this was always the problem. I mean, the, the analogy that I would use is to an extent is Barnes & Noble. Okay. So Barnes & Noble at it, in its heyday, it's hard to imagine that at one point Barnes & Noble was the dominant retailer of books in the United States, but it was, yeah. and still does a great job. They pretty much, you know, they, they made a 50% margin on the books that they sold because they bought them at a wholesale price. 
And they were competing in an environment in a mall where the majority of people who were the retailers made a 70 to 80 percent margin because they had manufacturer markups off of what they were doing, right? Whether it was The Gap or people like that. Whereas Barnes & Noble could never make the books themselves. They always had to buy them, but they had to compete for the same space as these other retailers did. And so they were always at a disadvantage in that respect. So what they had to do, and that's where they ultimately made their money, was by selling stuff at the front of the store that they could make a manufacturer's markup on, which is why you see all those stuffed dolls and those right, calendars yeah. and all those diaries and all those things, which pretty much comprise 25% of their business. So now you're at, with Spotify, and you're in a sort of similar situation, which is to be in the business, they have to have the music of the labels. But that's not necessarily, and I haven't talked to the people at Spotify, but I'm just saying this is the way I've seen it play out in the past. That's not necessarily where they'll make their money in the future. But you believe in that vision. You think there is enough diaries, calendars. Well, let's talk about those diaries. I, I think and there's it's, enough. You're talking about spoken word, essentially. It could, it, spoken word element. is certainly a big component of it, or it could be a Which big component. Which is podcasts, audiobooks. Po- exactly right. Yeah, that could be a big piece of it. The other thing that they do, which the big music companies don't like, is they infiltrate the playlist that they put out, which is where the majority of people listen to music on Spotify, with their own music. That's true. Which effectively, they have a much larger margin on. Right, it's the Whole Foods brand. Versus yeah, exactly. The podcasting, mm-hmm. big industry, growing industry. I wouldn't say it's a huge industry. We've talked about this on the show a bunch. It's right. like billion six plus in size, which mm-hmm. is not that big. Audiobooks are actually twice the size. I frequently quote those numbers just to give some context. Those are small. Mm-hmm. Recorded music is infinitely bigger than that at the mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. What's your long-term prognosis for podcasting? Can it ever truly be very big? very profitable can it solve things for spotify and others like that sure but just in general how does this become a massive industry can it be i think there are a couple of things that have to go into making it a massive industry i think it's growing really well and i think the advertisers are very happy and i think the audiences are growing Um, and i think you know things dramatically change for podcasting first with the smartphone and then secondly once you had this thing in everybody's ear you know airpods AirPods, or whatever the equivalent was because then you basically have audio always on right um but it's still a relatively immature industry in in a number of respects so for example you don't have genres really you don't have formats really well very early on for example in the world of uh television you, uh, comedies were 22 minutes and dramas were 44 minutes. And that's what you knew was there and that's what the audience was used to and that's what the advertisers were used to and that's, they knew where the ads would be inserted, the audience knew how long they were gonna watch this thing. Podcasts have none of those limitations. They can, some of them are an hour, some of them are 40 minutes, some of them are 30 minutes. It just depends on what they wanna talk about. Um, there's no formal review mechanism. There is no New York Times book review for podcasts. There's no, so people actually don't know how to understand whether, what's good. This is the discovery issue. Like how do I sort through this mountain of stuff? There's no um, real bestseller list or billboard tops charts, you know, that's also not there. So you need to get, you need to do that. And there's, by the way, real business in both those things. The New York Times book review makes good money and we don't have the equivalent in the podcast business, and Billboard makes good money, and we don't have the equivalent in the podcast business. Mm -hmm. So there's all of that. I think ultimately the podcast business has to figure out a way to get itself behind a paywall. Um, And, you know, the world does tend to divide itself up, not evenly, but divide itself up between advertising-supported businesses and subscription-driven businesses. I think what we've seen of late, particularly on the television world, is everybody piled in thinking the whole world is all going to be in on subscription. The truth is we've always known there's audience on both sides. Right Right now we don't have a real audience for podcasting in a subscription-driven business. And there has to be, they have to figure out a way to get at least part of that audience. Well, Spotify is. Yeah, but they're not behind the paywall on this right, one. Right, 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 right. Right? So th- if they were to put it behind the paywall, that would be a different matter. Right, right. Okay. So you're bullish, but things I'm need to happen. I'm very bullish, but I think some of this stuff has to happen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's do a lightning round. Rapid fire here. 
A what? Lightning round. All right. Rapid fire. Okay, We're going to no. go with a bunch of topics. All right. Just I'm slow, fast, for that. whatever you want. Okay. Well, let's just stick with podcasts. What's a podcast you've listened to recently that, that you like, that you recommend? This uh, the BBC had a great podcast on Putin that was sensational. Um, what else have I listened to of late? I'm trying to think for a minute. That was really good. That one was the one I thought that was the best of type right now. Okay. Putin. All right. TV show. What have you streamed of late? We talked about Winning Time. That was uh, Winning Time. Right. Uh, what was that show I just saw? Night Skies. Was that the one? I think it was. Which was, was terrific with Sissy Spacek. Great show. What is that on? Uh, I think it's on Prime. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think what else that I've seen of late that I really enjoyed. Um, I'm a big fan of Atlanta. I have to Atlanta. say, Atlanta. Yeah, okay. I think it's a station. It's an it's FX show, right? It's an FX show, and this season has been spectacular. Okay, Atlanta. Okay, yeah. good tips. I'm currently reading *The Candy House* by Jennifer Egan, which is spectacular. I, I recommend it. Uh, bef- just before that, I read uh, Tina Brown's uh, what was it called again? *Palace Papers*. Unbelievable. Also great. And then before that, I read *When We Cease to Understand the World*, which is really wonderful some too. good summer yeah. reading here yeah is there when you whenever you were running something or someone says hey is there is there a book that you kind of just like is your go-to that you may reread from time to time is there do you have one of those you know what i reread or used to read when i was in management a lot was you're gonna laugh and it makes me sound smarter than i am but i used to read stephen jay gould's essays because he was an evolutionary biologist and he would talk about things about how things evolved in nature and then relate them to the real world and I found them very helpful. So for example, he wrote a very famous essay once called While No but Nobody Will Ever Bat 400 Again, which, you know, in the early days I guess of baseball, the pitching was erratic, the batting was erratic, there was no professional coaching, so you had people who bet who batted over 400. And then all of a sudden as everything became normalized, Nobody ever batted really right. over 300. Ted Williams was the last, 406. Yeah. Right. So that then he said, and this is the way that life works in management and in business. Like you have industries where there are crazy overperformers, but when you bring professional management into play, all of a sudden things come down to the mean. His essays I always found extremely helpful. Interesting. Okay, Stephen Gould, I like that. Well, speaking of things that industries that are booming or whatever they are, Web3. Yeah. What is your perspective? That's the crypto world, tokens, NFTs. Have you spent time examining this? Do you have a perspective on anything from Bitcoin to Bored Apes or anything like that? I, I mean, do you own any of it? I do. I, you know, I bought a tiny, tiny piece of Bitcoin ten years ago with one of my kids and promptly lost the password. So that was it's my. It's gone. Time. That was that's that's pretty typical of me, and I think many people who are involved with this stuff. I don't really have a point of view on crypto one way or the other. That's very intelligent. Um, uh, I'm involved. I sit on the board of IEX, which just uh, announced a deal with FTX. So we're working together. So I see a little bit of around there. I probably am a much bigger fan or see a big future in in blockchain and how that may transform things than things like crypto. Got I it. Suspect. NFTs as well. Same thing. Yeah, I, I, you know, maybe NFTs stick around, but it, it appears to me to be very, I don't know, collectible and faddish. But again, I'm speaking with in, in ignorance here, so I don't really know. Oh, I, I, it's a fascinating world. At the end of the day, I think ultimately the winners here are IP, right? These right. are great. Right. Another expression of that IP that you can monetize. How big? Who knows? But, Who knows? Um, all right. So that's your Web three perspectives. Um, do you have, when, just going back to the Stephen Gould point, are there CEOs in your sort of history of CEOs that you particularly felt were exceptional, that you had a, a sort was, of North Star of being I like, had or? the benefit of working under a lot of great CEOs. I worked, you know, I was at Disney when Michael Eisner was there. He was fantastic. Howard Stringer was a great boss at Sony. Marjorie Scardino was a terrific boss at Pearson. We had A.G. Laffley on our board at, at, at Snap. So I've, I've actually seen a, a number of people who are really sensational. Um, you know, they each have their own. The, the, thing I, the thing that I admire most in, in many of them is, is really two things. One is, is courage and the other is decency. Just being a good human being. And those are th- some of the things and you common. mentioned about Evan. Yeah, very uh, much Evan so. Evan Spiegel. Very, Snap. very much so. He definitely has those characteristics. 
We're in an office setting here. Yep. It's fairly Spartan. Yeah. I don't see a lot of people. No. No, 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 there's accoutrements of books, but I'm not a Spartan of people. Right. I'm curious post pandemic what what, what we're going to take with us or what's going to stay and what's going to change. What's your take on working in an office? Are we going to be back fully at some point? Are you an advocate of that? What is your take on sort of. I personally am a big advocate of everybody being in the office. Um, And, you know, I. I'm confounded, to be honest, by by what's going on at the moment. I get it to a degree. I think part of it is people are still fearful. Part of it is people have gotten used to a different lifestyle. I And I was much more confident sort of six months ago that everybody was going to be back in the office. I'm beginning to worry that there's enough people who have agenda here, both in management and among the consultants and the employees themselves, who are committed to a hybrid work situation that we never will return to what I would have grown what I grew up with which is you know five six days a week um, I th- I guess there's some benefits to it but I have to say I think that the the negative aspects of it way outweigh the benefits and, and you know what those are sure the apprenticeship the collegiality the, the inspiration the loneliness like I mean if people yeah. tell us that loneliness is one of the biggest problems that you know affecting our society and community today I'm not quite clear how working remotely helps any of that I tend to agree. Anything else from the pandemic that you think we're gonna that that has changed or transformed that that is here to stay? Um, no, nothing that I don't think is already obvious to everybody else. Yeah. I think uh, because you're also an investor, you're you're quite yeah, a big venture yeah, investor. Yeah, no, but I, I I don't think there's anything that anybody you know yeah. the usual things that you've heard from everybody right. else. I right. think everybody right now is just trying to feel their way, and I think everybody is sort of a little uncertain. You yeah. know, it, the, the world hasn't settled in at this point to, to a normal cadence. In fact, it would, I would suggest it's exactly the opposite. Every yeah. time we think we're about to, like, get there, yet something else shows up to upend whatever that there is. It's a special time. That's right. the polite way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, you are a special executive. Oh, thank you. Incredible, thoughtful person. I am so... Um, Glad to know you, and thank you for spending time it's with us It's a pleasure. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks again.